Hey everyone, let's talk about Sketches of Brunswick East. This is the 11th album and the third album this year from everyone's favorite Melbourne septet, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. This has been quite a year for King Gizzard. February saw them exploring microtonal music, and in June they released a three-part story about the end of the universe. Now, King Gizzard are back at home with another album released completely out of the blue called Sketches of Brunswick East. If you haven't heard of them before, King Gizzard began as a psychedelic garage rock band in the late 2000s and released their first EP, Willoughby's Beach, in 2011. From there, they've been constantly expanding and refining their sound. The band has released records all over the spectrum, from a spoken word album with a western theme and an album with only acoustic instruments, to a pummeling garage rock epic that loops on itself and a haunting three-part tale about the destruction of the universe. King Gizzard's recent albums have been fairly impersonal, with stories about the apocalypse and strange alien landscapes, but this album deals with Brunswick East, which is a suburb of Melbourne that the band calls home. This album gives us a small glimpse into the everyday life of King Gizzard. Each song is a short vignette of scenarios that are reminiscent of the area. You can tell the band has a lot of love for Brunswick East because of the amount of passion and vivid imagery in each song. The album is also one of the most positive and optimistic that King Gizzard has written. On one song, the narrator is enamored with nature, particularly a huntsman spider, while another track creates imagery of a typical night on a street in Brunswick East. While tracks like Melting from Flying Microtonal Banana, The Bitter Boogie from Paper Mache Dream Balloon, and The River from Quarters sat on the fringe of a jazz sound, this album is immersed in it. This is partially due to the presence of The Mild High Club, who is a California artist who collaborated with King Gizzard on this album, and has a significant history in jazz, tracing back to a degree in jazz studies from a university in Chicago. There's lots of smooth and relaxed instrumentation on this album that ebbs and flows with tension, sometimes staying calm and straightforward, and other times branching out from the ideas and improvising. There's also the characteristic noise and distortion that King Gizzard add into their music, culminating on songs like Tezata with a freaky guitar that gets distorted and stretched and panned across the speakers, and the insidious A Journey to Shell with its medley of high-pitched wailing sounds and transient vocal samples. This album is tied together by a few motifs laid down in three title tracks. There is one that introduces the album, one in the middle to act as a bit of a palate cleanser and split the album into parts, and a final one to see the album out. It also sets the tone for the album and gives a glimpse into the kind of music you'll find here. Subtle and calm jazz rock that occasionally has a hint of funk. Each track has a different amount for each. Countdown, for example, is a nice mix of all three styles. It's introduced with a drum roll and starts off smooth but with a touch of unease as Stu McKenzie delivers these high-pitched and intimate vocals. He appears here much less frequently than on previous albums. It goes through a subdued and jazzy guitar solo and returns to the refrain before branching out into the first interlude, D-Day. Tezata is also an even mix of jazz and rock, but departs from the war themes of D-Day and Countdown and instead focuses on this very warm and fuzzy nostalgia. It's not entirely clear what the narrator is nostalgic for, though. There is this inclusion of some religious themes and the same text-to-speech voice used from Han Tayumi for Murder of the Universe, but the imagery on this song is more vague than on Countdown and The Spider in Me. The two interludes called D-Day and Crane's Plains Migraines are more rooted in rock and can be seen as continuations of Countdown and Tezata, respectively. These short interludes help to bridge the ideas of the first half together and give the feeling of a logical flow across the tracks. They are also considerably more upbeat than the more fleshed out tracks, which take on a very slow and subdued tone. This variation gives the songs a sense of tension and breaks up the slower passages, which was one of the biggest pitfalls of the sonically similar quarters. That album was slow and chilled out basically all the way through, and it became a bit monotonous by the end. A Journey to Shell and Rolling Stone are two of the more jazz-influenced songs on the album, albeit two very different sides of the same coin. The first is a tongue-in-cheek vignette of an insidious and uncomfortable experience at a local gas station. While the idea is pretty funny, the track is probably the weakest on the album from a musical standpoint, with lots of noisy and high-pitched whines drowning out the already uneasy jazz music. Rolling Stoned, on the other hand, is one of the most beautiful tracks on the album with a smooth and evocative flute melody leading relaxed instrumentation. This track is the most straightforward jazz song on here. It was originally intended as a cut from the Mild High Club's latest release, Skip Tracing, but it didn't quite make it there. The book and You Can Be Your Silhouette are the funkiest on the album. A teetering synth lead introduces the book and transitions into a seedy and mysterious verse about a man preaching on the street corner about the end of the world. The synths kind of sound like something is a bit off, and that's the least that can be said about the man described here. The vocals here are a little sinister and more gruff than usual. There's also a cool drum solo in the middle that sounds like it's being performed on the side of the street. You Can Be Your Silhouette is much more positive and less threatening than the book. 
It's the most skeletal track on the album, and the negative space is taken advantage of by the warbling guitars and the stripped back drum work. The vocals are very carefree and almost lethargic. The track becomes so stripped back at the end that there's barely anything left aside from the lazy guitar work. It picks up a little momentum before the closer, Sketches 3, presents the theme of the album one more time and brings it to a close. This closing track also features a sped up and reversed musical segment as a small homage to the end of Paper Mache Dream Balloon, where the entire album is played in reverse at an extreme speed before it all explodes. Thankfully there is no explosion here, and the album ends with a cool and calm note. Each track on the first half of the record paints a picture of a time in the mid-20th century. Countdown and D-Day are largely focused on World War II and the stress and anxiety that came with it. Everyone is under serious tension, and at this point all they can do is wait until something happens. The Spider in Me can be seen as a retaliation to the ideals in Tezata and Crane's Plains Migraines. All of the booming commercialization and the overwhelming religious overtone is too much for the narrator, so in retaliation he begins to identify with nature, pushing it to such an extreme that he begins to fall in love with the spider. Anything is possible with free love, right? Sketches 2 acts as a palate cleanser for the first section. The piece at the beginning of the track is sort of a reprise to the mid-1900s vignettes. It fades away to refocus on the themes from Sketches 1 before exploring the more grounded musical ideas in the second section. This part of the album is devoid of the short interludes from the first half, and each song stands on its own without existing as a transition between two ideas. This section also feels more modern, emulating the sound of an ordinary street corner on Brunswick East, complete with inner-city ambience. Dusk to Dawn on Ligon Street features the sounds of crickets in the background, a barking dog, and the occasional passing car. The book is a rude awakening from the sleepier instrumentation from Dusk Dawn on Ligon Street, with the sound of sirens, honking horns, and a nearby street performer later in the track. The vignettes and themes become much less ambiguous and more vivid on the second half of the album. After Sketches 2, Dusk to Dawn on Ligon Street describes the nightfall in the Little Italy district of Brunswick East. The song first talks about wildlife settling down for the night. Even the vocal delivery here is sleepy. There's also a bit of reflection on how beautiful the transition from day to night is. Things take a much darker and more crazy turn, though, with the violent prophetic rants of the book. It's about a man who believes that God spoke to him about the apocalypse, and now he has to get his message out by preaching to people on the side of the road. Not only is the end near, but all sinners must be eradicated violently. The man speaks of seppuku, which is a form of public suicide in Japan. He insists that none of this is a fable, and these visions are a gift from God. Rolling Stone has no lyrics, but it sets the mood for the positive and self-empowering you can be your silhouette. It talks about taking time to step back and giving some time to yourself. King Gizzard probably know this better than anyone, with the constant touring and the uh, producing an unsustainable amount of albums in a year. Overall, King Gizzard have crafted another amazing album with sketches of Brunswick East. Each album that they create is more sonically vivid than the last, and it's hard to imagine that they can perfect their sound further. Although the first half feels more intimately connected musically than the second half, the entire album creates vivid mental imagery and has all kinds of different ideas, emotions, and situations explored. The production on an album as subtle as this one can easily make or break it. King Gizzard managed to create a full and lush production that gives all the instruments room to breathe and be heard. Mild High Club also deserves a lot of recognition for bringing the jazzier side of King Gizzard's sound into fruition. I would be totally down to see another collaboration with Mild High Club or even other artists to push their sound in another direction. What did you think of this album? I would love to hear your thoughts if you loved it as much as I did, or if you didn't care for it much, or whatever. Thanks for listening, everyone. Tune in next week for a review of getting into a pool and suddenly a family of nine shows up. I'll see you guys next time.